Uh, well, we will continue with our perusal of Athenian ruins. Now, another ancient structure encountered by Stuart Rivette in their probing of Athens was the west entrance or gate to what was originally the city's Roman agorum. This is their view of how they found the structure, embedded in a jumble of vernacular habitations complete with roosting storks. By contrast, this is their view of how they found the structure, as I said, and this restoration drawing reveals a monumental composition composed of paired Greek Doric columns supporting a fully developed Doric portico. The gate was built during the Roman occupation of Athens, the Hellenistic period, with funds donated by Julius Caesar and Caesar Augustus. Even so, its details follow a strict Greek Doric canon with no hint of Roman versions of the Doric order. In fact, the gate was dedicated to Athena, the patron god of Athens, not to a Roman Caesar. Well, the clinging later structures have long since been peeled away. This is the gate as it appears today reasonably intact and with the inevitable little red car that follows me all around the world. <laughs> the gate, like most of Stuart Rivette's published images, has proven to be a popular model for additions and attachments to architectural works ever since. And perhaps, going back, the earliest versions of the design are the flanking porticos of the Berlin's Brandenburg Gate. And as we saw with the gate's center section, Carl Langens couldn't bring himself to address his design in strict Greek classicism. His columns and tablature are decidedly Roman, with bases on the columns. But the Greek form is there, paired Doric columns supporting a pediment. Now what may be the earliest, more properly Greek-style reference to the gate is John Nash's 1821 Doric Villa, a standalone work among the many magnificent terraces designed for London's Regent's Park and also Regent Street. But we see it here in an 1830s print. But fear not, the villa survives, beautifully renovated with a jaw-dropping price tag. And here the gate's form is applied to the facade as an engaged portico. Now going north, in England, the motif is seen as a projecting portico for the 1830 Yorkshire Museum in York, England, another Greek revival scheme by William Wilkins mentioned earlier. The portico is somewhat reduced, but otherwise is a faithful reproduction of its ancient source, and the portico serves as an instructive feature for a museum, one generating discussion, perhaps promoting architectural literacy, which many new museum designs failed to do. In this country, a sampling of the motif includes the 1855 historic courthouse in Lynchburg, Virginia. Its architect, uh, William E. Ellison, came to Lynchburg as a division engineer for the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad. He knew his Stuart Rivette and enriched his design not only with its portico, but with engaged side porticos and a dome topped with a belfry. Lynchburg's courthouse was later given an impressive setting with the construction of a monumental staircase, a World War I memorial climbing heart-pumpingly to the courthouse's hilltop site. The Roman Agora Portico was interpreted in a somewhat provincial vein for the 1840 Frederick County Courthouse in Winchester, Virginia. Now the solid character of the ancient original is evident, but the columns are unfluted and the triglyphs are reeded rather than defined with glyphs, nor are the metopes square as they always are supposed to be. Now a little known but noteworthy use of the Roman Agora Gate dominates the facade of the 1910 John Germain Memorial Library in Sag Harbor, New York. This cunning building is the work of Augustus N. Allen, a talented New York architect who's really also little known. But the work reveals how an ancient motif can effectively distinguish a scheme that otherwise has scant architectural precedent. In this case, it's just a compact dome brick building with chamfered corners. Now, Allen added a criteria to the pediment, a fully appropriate ancient Greek detail, but one not found on the ancient gate. It's just a bit of informed embellishment. As for today, British architect Quinlan Terry demonstrates how the use of the classical language for contemporary design can be a welcome intervention in a historic context. Terry's Downing College Library, fronted by this Roman Agora gate, 
is fully at home in Cambridge's world famous architectural assemblage. Here the priority was to complement rather than contrast with its surroundings, which is a welcome polite gesture. And if it's difficult to immediately determine the age of this building, I think it succeeds. Well, Terry also contributed to the enrichment of Regent's Park with his designs for a series of villas in different historic styles for aesthetic as well as didactic purposes. His Doric Villa here was in the final stages of construction when I photographed it in 2002. And like Nash's Doric Villa, Terry used an engaged version of the Roman Agora Gate for the facade. But the opposite side, overlooking the park's canal, uses the motif as a freestanding portico. The lesson we can take from these examples is that a good idea is worth repeating. All right, next, the Choragic Monument of Thrasyllus. We see in Stuart Rivette's drawing of the south face of the Acropolis a curious facade fronting a shallow cave. Reading an inscription on it, Stuart Rivette identified the structure as the Choragic Monument of Thrasyllus. The monument celebrated a prize won by the choral group headed by Thrasyllus. Choragic just means choir. Now the monument dated from 320 BC, but unfortunately, it was completely destroyed by the Turks in 1827 during the war for Greek independence. We see the cave circled here and circled here and the Parthenon on the Acropolis above it. Fortunately, enough of the monuments survived in the mid-18th century for Stuart Rivet to make this restoration drawing of it. Now, the monument was distinguished by a tall parapet interrupted by three steps where the bronze trophies were originally placed. And the sculpture shown here was a later addition. This statue was, is not original. Now, the opening was divided by a slender central pier. Its frieze was decorated with olive wreaths, symbols of success or victory. Now, remarkably, the monument has been partially reconstructed beginning in 2002, incorporating several original fragments. But the points I want to make about it focus on Stuart Rivette's restoration elevation. Its form and details have served as inspiration for numerous adaptations well into today. An early version of the monument is the circa 1800 garden temple on the grounds of Lincolnshire College of Art and Design in England. But here, as we shall see, most of the adaptations eschewed the Thrasyllus Monument central pier in favor of a central bay or opening framed by piers. Now, we recall Grange Park with its Hephaestian portico. Architect William Wilkins also added gigantic versions of the Thrasyllus Monument to its side elevations, but Wilkins favored two freestanding piers rather than a central one, and note that it has a Thrasyllus parapet. And although inspired by the Thrasyllus Monument, architect James H. Dakin also avoided the central pier in favor of two piers framing the entrance of his design for the 1839 New Orleans Arsenal. Inspired by the Thrasyllus Monument, but not a copy. And Dakin, as you can see, created his own design for the parapet, not copying the original. Now, in Virginia, famed architect Alexander Jackson Davis adapted the Thrasyllus Monument for his design for a temperance temple at Bremo Plantation, home of General John Hartwell Cox. Cox was a leader in the 19th century temperance movement. He wanted to encourage people to drink water instead of whiskey. So he had the temple built to frame a spring of fresh water, an effort to make drinking water attractive instead of whiskey. People drank whiskey to quench thirst back then. They were drunk all the time. Well, the temple was situated on the edge of the James River and Kanawha Canal, just below Cox's famous Jeffersonian mansion. And Davis used, as you can see, two Greek Doric columns rather than the central pier. But Cox failed to notice that the spring harbored a large patch of fresh mint. So when passengers on the passing canal boats spied the cool spring water and fresh mint, they just pulled out their flasks of bourbon and put two and two together, <laughs> made mint julep, so much for temperance. 
Well, nevertheless, Brimo's temperance temple served as inspiration for a new public entrance to Jefferson's Virginia State Capitol. This was dedicated in 2007, the quadricentennial of the founding of Virginia. Slight modifications were made by having implied triglyphs rather than fully expressed ones and smooth column shafts rather than fluted shafts. Now, as I said, a good idea can sometimes be worth repeating more than once. For instance, this is a developer's proposal for a new townhouse on Richmond's Monument Avenue, I'm showing a number of Richmond places. That's my hometown. The local preservation organization fussed that this design was too dumbed down to be compatible with the avenue's rich architectural assemblage, and I agreed. So working with the architect, it was determined that the facade's basic format was okay and that all that was needed was refining the details and increasing the building's height. Well, the details were improved and the height was gained by adding a thrasillus parapet, giving the facade some appropriate historic reference on the historic street. And here is the completed project. And this is just to reemphasize the point that Greek classicism can be a useful design resource for a diversity of building types. And this also proved to be true for the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. Here the architect boldly employed a Thrasyllus central pier to the side window. Or as Carl Frederick Schenkel did with his use of a central pier for the rear entrance of the Charlottenhof Palace in Potsdam. We see in this detail Stuart Rivette's image of the Thrasyllus Monument's order, including the wreaths in the frieze. Now, this capital doesn't fit any version of the classical canon. It's unique to this building. But notice the tenia, the simple band separating the frieze from the architrave. Underneath this tenia is a continuous row of gutai representation of the wooden pegs used in ancient timber framing. Now this use of the tenia with this row of guta is unique to the Thrasyllus monument. This is what gets architectural historians' hearts going pitter-patter. Anyway, and this has been the ultimate source for scores and scores of versions of the motif. Moreover, it's a powerful demonstration of the power of publication to disseminate architectural ideas and concepts. So, what do we call this motif? Well, tenia with continuous guta, what else? <laughs> well, let's look at a quick sampling. A porch in Savannah, Georgia. A doorway in London. A doorway in Greenwich Village. And that new house on Monument Avenue seen earlier, but if you look closely, you will see that dentals are used instead of the peg-shaped guta. That often happens. Dentals are just easier to make than goo time. Uh, the facade of the Charlottenhof Palace, including wreaths like the original, but widely spaced, as are the goo time. And we have it on a building at Trinity College, Dublin, also with wreaths. A former bank in Charleston, but with better wreaths. And the Lincoln Memorial. Note the tenia with continuous goo time and with overlapping wreaths and even the rotunda of the United States Capitol, but with oak leaf wreaths. And back down to earth in Virginia with this worker's dwelling house in Petersburg. So the motif, as you can see, is really quite common. Look for it. And all ultimately generated by one image published 234 years ago. And it can be a useful, easily made detail with good DNA. Earlier we looked at the gateway to the Roman Agora. We'll now consider a unique landmark within the Agora's confines. We see an octagonal structure commonly known as the Tower of the Winds because of the eight sculpted panels of eight mythological winds decorating the wide frieze at the top. Now, when Stuart Rivette encountered the tower, the ground had risen around it some 15 feet. It required the assistance of local Turks to dig it out for recording. These are the resulting restored views, showing the tower with two dwarf porticos. Evidence for the porticos was found in the excavation. Now, Stuart and Rivette's recordings resulted in 18 engraved plates in volume one of the Antiquities of Athens, 
including detailed depictions of each wind sculpture. Now, as with other ancient monuments, the Tower of the Winds has inspired a number of adaptations. Interestingly, James Stewart himself designed two adaptations based on his notes and drawings. The first is what's called the Temple of the Winds at Mount Stewart in County Down in Northern Ireland with its requisite dwarf porticos. The tower occupies a commanding site overlooking the sea. Stewart's second tower is at Shugra Park in Staffordshire, also with dwarf porticos, but the ground floor windows here are a later alteration. Now, a very imaginative variation on the tower is seen in the upper portion of the Radcliffe Observatory at Oxford University, designed by James Wyatt. The sculpted panels of the eight winds were copied on the wide frieze at the top, just like the original. And Petersburg, Virginia's courthouse has one tier of its clock tower inspired by the Tower of the Winds. Looking closely at this tour, we see that it's properly octagonal, like the original tower, and employs the tower's modified Corinthian order, which I will discuss shortly. The best I could do for a version of the Tower of the Winds in my hometown of Richmond, Virginia, is this 1930 service station that stood downtown, but alas, it's no more. But why shouldn't a service station reflect great classical architecture? Nevertheless, the service station is somewhat memorialized in the stair tower of the Richmond Convention Center. Okay, as we've seen, the tower's octagonal form has prompted various designs, but one particular feature of the Tower of the Winds has had extraordinary impact, especially in this country. And I'm talking about the distinctive order of the columns of its dwarf portico. The order has an almost generic entablature, but the capital is the point of interest. We see what some have defined as a modified Greek Corinthian order consisting of just one row of acanthus leaves with palm fronds springing above them. And the simple beauty and clarity of the form has kept it popular into the present. And for want of a better term, we describe it as the Tower of the Winds order. And famed though it is, one surviving original capital is unceremoniously kept in a cage-like structure near the base of the tower. This famous capital deserves better than this. Nevertheless, the tower's capital was long known only through Stuart Rivette's published image. And it was this image that ultimately has been responsible for the remarkable spread of the form's popularity, particularly in America. I could show many examples, but time limits me to just a handful. The capital was particularly popular for residential works because it has the elegance of the main Corinthian order but it's less ornate and pretentious, as well as less expensive and easier to craft. So we find it lending dignity to the Governor Van Zant House in Newport, Rhode Island, and all the way down to the stately Sturdivant Hall in Selma, Alabama. In Richmond, the 1813 Governor's Mansion was made more welcoming by the 1830 edition of a front porch embellished with the order. Architect Alexander Jackson Davis enriched the house chamber of the historic North Carolina Capitol with the Tower of the Winds order. And as for gracing one of America's most popular cultural icons, we see it gracing Graceland, home of Elvis Presley in Memphis. And I would like to think it was the portico and its capitals that drew Elvis to this house. Well, the Tower of the Winds capitals are still commercially available from architectural supply companies and can add prestige to new work if properly applied. In the twisting streets of the Placa, the ancient settled neighborhood below the Acropolis, Stuart Rivette came across a small monument encased in the walls of a Capuchin monastery. Now, enough of the monument was accessible to make detailed examination, and from it, Stuart Rivette produced restoration drawings for publication. And this elevation shows the monument revealed, freestanding as it was originally. From inscriptions, Stuart and Rivette identified the structure as the Choragic Monument of Lysocrates. Again, Choragic just means choral. Lysocrates sponsored a choral group that won a singing contest. The prize was a bronze trophy that originally was placed atop the monument's fancy finial. Now, I formally pronounce the name Lysocrates, 
until my Greek friend said I should pronounce it the Greek way, Lysocrates. So bear with me, that's how I'm going to say it. Well, the monastery was destroyed in 1821 during the Greek War for Independence, revealing the monument fully exposed. And it was restored by French archaeologists several decades later. We see the monument as it appears today, and notice the pedestrian for scale. The monument is not big. Well, Stuart Rivette's depiction of the monument's order conveyed its exceptional beauty, and it became the standard for Greek Corinthian since. Moreover, the order is unique to this monument, found nowhere else on ancient Greek structures. Now, the Lysocrates Corinthian is similar to Roman Corinthian, but it's full of vigor and movement, with swirling helices and shaft flutes that flare out at the top in place of an astragal. The Roman Corinthian appears somewhat stolid by comparison. As for its use, Benjamin Henry de Trobe is credited with perhaps America's earliest design using the Lysocrates Corinthian. La Trobe was commissioned to supervise rebuilding of the U.S. Capitol following its burning by the British in the War of 1812. He employed the order to frame the former Speaker's platform in the House of Representatives chamber, uh, which of course now is Statuary Hall. And the capitals are canonically correct, but Latrobe put his own stamp on the cornice by incorporating medallions, which the original cornice didn't have. But that's acceptable license. When I earlier discussed the Tower of the Winds, I implied that it's rare to see the Corinthian order on private residence, saying it was superseded by the simpler Tower of the Winds order. So for architectural spotters like me, it's always gratifying to come across a house sporting the Lysocrates Corinthian. There aren't many of them. And two noteworthy but far apart examples are the Chisholm Alston House in Charleston and the Samuel Russell House up north in Middletown, Connecticut, the latter designed by Town and Davis. All right, the palatial terraces framing London's Regent's Park apparently inspired a developer named Seth Gear to think that such development would suit New York City. He thus attempted a similar formula for LaGrange Terrace, also known as Colonnade Row, completed in 1833 in Lower Manhattan. The terrace consisted of nine residences, each with 26 rooms. The whole was fronted by 28 two-story columns in Lysocrates Corinthian. Five of the units were demolished in 1902 for commercial development. The remaining four units seen here fell into decline but have undergone rehabilitation in recent years. Their columns are Sing Sing marble, which have not weathered terribly well. And in case you fail to notice, one of the weathered capitals is also displayed in the courtyard of the Metropolitan Museum's American Wing. Well, more lively and more accurate are the columns on my own church, uh, Richmond St. Paul's Episcopal Church, an admirable Greek revival work by Philadelphia architect Thomas Stewart. And these capitals will never weather because they are cast iron. So we have technology facilitating tradition, which is a good thing. We need more of that. An exceptional application of the Lysocrates order for both form and details is William Strickland's Merchants Exchange in Philadelphia. Like Colonnade Row, the order extends two full stories. Unfortunately, the marble capitals on this elevation have suffered serious weathering, but those on the opposite side are better protected and are well preserved, showing the original beauty of the order. Strickland's special touch is the exchange's cupola closely modeled on the ancient monument. And Strickland adapted the Lysocrates monument once more as the cupola for his masterpiece, the Tennessee State Capitol, a chief work of American Greek Revival architecture. The cupola's height, 112 feet, is in perfect scale with the massive building it tops and is more than three times the height of the ancient Lysocrates monument, which is only 34 feet tall. And as we have seen, architects like to design their own spin on famous architectural works. This was certainly done with the cupola atop the 23-story Hibernia Bank Building in New Orleans. This huge creation is the Lysocrates monument on steroids, 
And at one time, it served as a navigation beacon for ships along the Mississippi River. But I wouldn't call this a parody. It's really an informed modern work inspired by ancient precedent, but now somewhat disfigured by its new use as a cell tower. All right, we'll now take a brief look abroad at selected works displaying the Lysocrates' influence. A cunning work is this work here designed by Carl Frederick Schenkel, a garden pavilion called the Rotunda in the park of Schloss Gleiniki in Potsdam, Germany. It was commissioned by Prince Charles of Prussia, son of King Frederick William III of Prussia, and was used for tea parties and other leisurely social gatherings. It's a circular structure, and it's supported on Lysocrates' Corinthian columns and topped with a simplified version of the Lysocrates monument and crowned with a gilded trophy. Appropriately, some of Europe's most competent Greek revival designs are found in Athens. The city's National Theater of Greece has the character of a Renaissance palazzo, but with Greek detailing. And the Lysocrates Corinthian expresses the projecting freestanding columns defining the building's piano nobile. The theater's architect, Ernst Ziller, was German-born and trained, but designed numerous works throughout Greece and became a Greek citizen. Now, a splendid display of Lysocrates Corinthian dominates the exterior of the Austrian Parliament building. This is an outstanding landmark among the parade of landmarks on Vienna's Ringstrasse. We noted its architect earlier as the design of the National Library of Athens. And although Theophilus Hansen was Danish, his various commissions in Venice led to his becoming an Austrian citizen. His choice of the stately Greek character for the Austrian parliament was considered appropriate because of its connection to ancient Greek ideals of democracy. And Hansen was responsible for every detail of the building, outside and within. We saw its federal assembly chamber in the first session. Equally striking is the Regal Hall of Pillars, a peristyle of monolithic columns of colorful Austrian adnet marble with gilded Lysocrates capitals. It's telling what one small monument can inspire. Well, there were other ancient versions of the Greek Corinthian, but they are exceptionally rare. What may be the earliest known example of a Greek Corinthian column, or a column with leaves all around it, was the single axial column on the interior of the temple of Apollo Epicurus at Bassi, high in the mountains of the Greek Peloponnese, not visited by Stuart and Rivet. We see that column in this restoration drawing of the interior by British architect Charles Cockrell, who undertook a study of the temple in 1812. Its column is outlined here, just one of them. And except for a few fragments, which are in Russia, the column's capital does not survive. But it was recorded by Cockrell in this drawing. And the Grecian character of the Bassi capital inspired to some degree the Corinthian order employed on the Philadelphia Museum of Art, an elegant modern interpretation, one set off by Grecian-style polychromy, as were most details of ancient Greek temples. This is really an extraordinary building, an extraordinary complex, actually. Now, I found only one precise copy of the Bassi Corinthian capital being used on an existing building. We see it on the porch of an 1848 Hackerman house on Mount Vernon Place in Baltimore. The house is now part of the Walters Art Museum complex. And I hope this example might encourage its use today. It's really an engaging version of the Corinthian. And your assignment is to find a copy, find one of these somewhere in Manhattan. Now, I want to jump back to New York briefly for a creative but interesting use of Greek detailing. But first, compare the Tower of the Winds capital again with the Lysocrates Corinthian. One's restrained, the other's pretty fancy. Well, the architects of the Bowling Green Office Tower, a building adjacent to Manhattan's Battery Park, decided to combine the best of both orders. Here on the ground floor facade of this office tower, we have Lysocrates flared fluting and row of olive leaves topped by a Tower of the Winds capital, in turn topped by the concave-sided abacus of the Lysocrates capital. 
such experimentation with mix and match is not to be discouraged as long as you respect the integrity of each element. All right, Delos. Not all the Greek ruins studied and recorded by Stuart and Rivet were in Athens. They found time to make an expedition to the island of Delos in the Aegean. Delos was a holy sanctuary in ancient times with many temple complexes, but the Turks had long been using the ruins as quarries, so our architect friends found just mostly fragments. One of the temple sites had been identified as the Temple of Apollo. Among its scattered fragments were pieces of columns and entablature from which Stuart Rivette produced this reconstruction image of the order, three columns supporting a Doric entablature. This illustration shows the columns with smooth shafts except for a thin band of fluting just below the capital and at the bottom of the shaft pointed out. Now Stuart Rivette surmised that the main areas of the shaft were left smooth because they were wrapped with tapestries during ceremonies. Scholars now believe that the columns were actually just unfinished. Whatever, this peculiar treatment created interest and led to imitation. One of the earliest uses of this Delos Dory was by Nicholas Rivette himself on New Lawrence Church in Hertfordshire, England. If we look closely at its column shafts, we see the thin banding of fluting at top and bottom. In Regensburg, Bavaria, French-trained architect Emmanuel Aragoyen employed the order for a circular memorial to astronomer Johannes Kepler. The memorial is an example of Europe's 19th century enlightenment proclivity to erect monuments to scholars, scientists, and philosophers. In this country, Robert Mills used a somewhat attenuated version of the Delos Doric in the portico columns of Richmond's monumental church. The fluting bands are taller than the historic precedent, but they work okay here. By contrast, Mills opted for massive Delos Doric columns on the interior of the former patent office, now the National Portrait Gallery. So familiarity with such esoteric details can attract your attention in unexpected places. Who knows if the carpenter of this front porch was aware of the Delos Dory. Even so, if it weren't for Stuart and Rivette, this porch would probably look different. And speaking of unexpected places, here we have the Delos Dory used for lamp standards in front of the former HSBC bank building in Shanghai, China. So the point is, the Delos Doric is a distinctive variation of the Greek Doric with an interesting story and can be an effective design resource for new classicism. All right, I'm going to depart from Messrs. Stuart and Rivette to deal with another source for Greek classicism, one not in Greece but in southern Italy, Pestum, originally Posidonia, named in honor of Poseidon. Pestum is the Latin version of the name, and Pestum was founded by the Greeks around 600 BC. Dominating the settlement were three muscular temples, Athena, Hera I, and Hera II. Over the years, the settlement's lowland site became marshy and silted over. The subsequent spread of malaria mosquitoes inhibited access, and Pestum was essentially forgotten. In 1752, the construction of a nearby road led to the rediscovery of Pestum. The three temples were relatively intact and became objects of interest. Well, the site soon became widely known to the public through the publication of some 22 seductively romantic engravings of the temples by the indefatigable Giovanni Piranesi. We see one of his engravings here. Also, various architects took notice of Pestum's temples as design resources. This interest was spurred by the publication of two profusely illustrated works, Thomas Major's 1768 Ruins of Pestum and William Wilkins' 1807 Antiquities of Modern Graecia. You remember Wilkins, previously mentioned. Despite the notion by some that Pestum's temples were archaic works, not on a par with Athenian monuments, these publications served to make Pestum's robust Greek character fashionable. One of America's earliest adaptation of Pestum's virility was Arlington House by British-trained architect George Hadfield, mentioned earlier. This 
prodigious dwelling is set off by thick pestum style Doric columns. Its robust character was intentional, meant to make the house visible from a great distance, as it still is, easily seen from Washington, D.C., across the Potomac. Now we get a taste of Thomas Major's documentation with this restoration elevation of Pestum's Temple Hera I, often erroneously referred to as the Basilica. It's not. The temple is unique for its portico center column, clearly shown in Major's elevation, pointed out in the drawing. Well, the temple's columns have exaggerated entesis, and they also have a distinctive detail at the base of the capital, just below the echinus, shown by both Thomas Major and William Wilkins. The echinus is the elliptical molding below the abacus, and the abacus is the block topping the capital. All right, I'm pointing at the echinus here. And notice below the echinus the row of compressed stylized leaves. Well, so what? Well, so we have a striking cluster of heroine Doric columns in the undercroft of the United States Capitol, the work of Benjamin Henry Latrobe. Unfortunately, we can't document Latrobe's published source since his extensive architectural library was lost at sea, but Thomas Major's book is a likely source, as you can see in the engraving. Well, this order is repeated in Latrobe's design for the Capitol's old Supreme Court chamber, a stunning space in the form of a hemicycle covered by a daring umbrella vault. Here the columns are fluted, like the originals. And in the 21st century, architect John Simpson employed the same order on small scale for the entrance to the Queen's Gallery at Buckingham Palace. And the exaggerated emphasis of the columns closely follows the shafts in the columns of William Wilkins' section drawing of the Pestum Temple of Hera I. Well, in this example, we have a more freely interpreted version of the Hera I capital. The band of compressed leaves is a little more complex, and the abacus is decorated with a Greek key, an ancient symbol of infinity. Moreover, the Doric column has a base, something you would never find on an ancient Greek Doric column. Yet it's a literate, informed improvisation of ancient precedent. Now, if this looks familiar, it's on the entrance to the bar building, just a few doors from here on 44th Street. Take a look at it on your way home. Now, I will close with a very brief look at a random selection of 21st century projects, just a half dozen to reiterate the point that Greek classicism is and can be a design resource for today. First, the Bodleian Art and Architecture and Ancient World Library at Oxford University, formerly named the Sackler Library, by Adam Architects of England. The Greek Doric is worked into the entrance pavilion as well as into the main library building looming up behind it. Next, a columbarium by the late Thomas Gordon Smith. Though not a temple, the work is infused with the lean geometry and timeless quality of Greek classicism the Tuscaloosa Federal Building and Courthouse by Thomas Beebe. This indeed is directly inspired by a temple, the ancient Greek temple of Zeus at Nemea. Greek temples, old and new, always look good. That's what classic means. And the Duncan Art Galleries in Lincoln, Nebraska by Dimitri Porfirios. This is a real Greek architect's vision of what the ancient Greeks might design today and the St. Paul's Church organ case by John Blateau. The details and ornaments for this case are based on Grecian details published in Minard Lefevre's 1835 Beauties of Modern Architecture, as are most of the details in the historic church. Also incorporated in the case are features from the dining room of the Yalagin Palace in St. Petersburg, Russia by Carlo Rossi. All these details are out there just for the taking. And finally, the Walsh Family Hall at the Notre Dame University School of Architecture by John Simpson, a place from which we look for great things to come. And please note that the tower cupola is inspired by the choragic monument of Lysocrates. So to close, the ICAA is dedicated to the premise that classical architecture has relevance and meaning for today that its principles, forms, and details can add perspective and character
to new designs, and as I hope I have shown, when applied with informed creativity, the ancient Greek vocabulary can deliver landmarks for the future. Thank you. Thank you.